It's Wednesday, the 29th of April, 2020, day 48 of the new normal at Santa Monica College. This is the Pandemic Podcast, your twice a week news and culture guide to surviving and thriving in the age of coronavirus. I'm Glenn Zuckman. And I'm Jackie Sedley. Today on the podcast, from Tokyo, former Santa Monica College Corsair Editor-in-Chief, Dakota castets Vier, and from Florida, former Corsair Managing Editor, Yasser Marte. Dakota and Yasser, welcome to the Pandemic Podcast. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Excited to be here. Uh, Dakota, to start with you, um, when did you arrive in Tokyo? What was it like? And, and then when did the pandemic arrive and how are things now in Tokyo? Right. So, so I moved out to Tokyo in mid-December uh, before the new year, before 2020 came and decided to uh, mess with all of us. And uh, I arrived and things were still relatively normal. We hadn't heard anything about uh, the coronavirus uh, up until that point. And uh, so we just kind of settled in. I moved in with my girlfriend. We, uh, we went ahead and found ourselves an apartment in a nice part of Tokyo that we liked. And I went out, found a job and, uh, you know, went about life uh, pretty normally. Um, and then in about mid-January, uh, my girlfriend, who is uh, Chinese, uh, started to hear rumblings from her family in mainland China uh, about this virus that was spreading and the possible dangers that it would present us, um, especially living in a place like Japan, where a lot of Chinese immigrants come and work, especially in Tokyo, uh, and kind of go back and forth. And this was all starting to appear around the time of Chinese New Year, which is a typical period of, uh, of travel back and forth to China and then back to Japan for Chinese individuals who are living in Japan. So we immediately started to take some measures on our own to kind of protect ourselves. We started wearing masks, which is very normal standard behavior here in Japan uh, when there's a sickness or during flu season, even, even it's very common to take a train here and to see people just wearing masks uh, in the winter season. But we immediately started to take some precautionary measures, started stocking up on food um, and kind of imposed a soft quarantine on ourselves so that we didn't mm. go we didn't need to. Uh, of course, you know, as time went on, things became clearer and the dangers of the coronavirus became so pressing that we decided to permanently quarantine ourselves. And so we have actually been working from home um, and staying at home pretty much all the time since early February. Um, oh, so, so five, six weeks before us here in Southern California. Yeah. Yeah, so we, you know, we took a preemptive measure just, just for our personal safeties. Um, it definitely wasn't the norm in Tokyo at the time, uh, but we wanted to be conscious of the risks. And so, you know, as a result, we've been, we've been inside since mid-February. So now what is it? It's, it's almost two and a half months. Right? Am I doing my math right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, we've been, that we've been stuck inside. Um, and uh, it's definitely been an adventure. Um, and it's been, it's been interesting to observe um, how the Japanese government has handled this whole situation and the differences between it and the different nations in the world. And um, for us to kind of experience life being closed in here as opposed to life closed in in the United States. What's going on in Tokyo generally now? Um, so it's, it, it was all kind of interesting around the Olympics because, I, you know, as, as you may know, uh, the Olympics were supposed to be here in the summer for 2020, Tokyo Olympics, and it was a, a huge source of sort of national pride and uh, an economic head, you know, betting in terms of uh, bringing in a bunch of tourism and bringing in a bunch of revenue into an economy that's kind of living on a knife's edge as it stands already. Mm -hmm. um, and so... Immediately when the coronavirus really started to spread around, you know, more of Asia outside of just China, you know, there were some, a lot of early signs out of, for instance, South Korea, that things were going to get really bad, really fast. Japan kind of took a slower approach. Um, they didn't test a lot of people. They didn't necessarily raise an alarm. They were hesitant to kind of declare a state of emergency. And so what all that kind of caused was a lot of confusion as to whether or not you know, this was an actual risk or whether or not people needed to take it seriously, especially because the government was signaling for a long time that um, they wanted to do whatever they could to preserve the Olympics in the summer. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and that lasted for, for several weeks after things started to kind of get bad. Um, and eventually, 
they announced that the Olympics uh, wouldn't be going forward and that they would postpone it for a year. And that kind of caused a little bit of a mass panic in Tokyo. Uh, people started going out and clearing out shops. And so, you know, toilet paper, the essentials, a bunch of non-perishable food started to disappear all over the place as people realized that this was a serious risk to their health. And since that point, Japan's government has seemed to take the, the virus a bit more seriously. Uh, testing numbers went up. Uh, a state of emergency was declared just a couple weeks ago. All of this to say there was a bit of a delayed reaction. Um, while the rest of the world was already taking major preemptive hmm. measures, wow. uh, the Japanese government kind of was slow to react for what a lot of journalists out here, especially, are, are speculating is uh, in a bid to kind of preserve the Olympics. And also, just in general, as I hinted to earlier, the Japanese economy kind of exists on a knife ed knife's edge at this point. Um, and so they are they were really scared that, you know, any kind of quarantine order or any kind of emergency order would almost irreparably damage the economy. And um, and so that hesitancy sort of still exists in daily life. You know, I, I go outside and I still see people everywhere. Um, you know, we just we just had it's, it's about to be Golden Week, which is a major holiday in Japan here. Uh, it's like a week long of holidays so where people have it off of work and um, we're also in the middle of cherry blossom season, which they call the Sakura season, uh, which is a very common time to see people going out and taking picnics with their families and just kind of interacting with, you know, their local environments. And I personally haven't observed a decline in the amount of people that I see out and about, even though we are living under a state of emergency as of this mm -hmm. moment. The only noticeable difference really is that our my girlfriend and I's works have uh, allowed us to work from home um, and uh, more people are wearing masks. But just last week, the Japan Times, which is an English language newspaper subsidiary of the New York Times, released a uh, statistic from a study that they did that even though there is a stay at home order, somewhere around 60 to 75 percent of employees are still daily commuting to the office. Uh, oh, wow. still taking the trains, still in close proximity to each other. Um, Seems like Tokyo is then much less shut down than Los Angeles at this point. Yeah, I, I would argue that Tokyo really, I mean, with the exception of, of some smaller shops, are, is really not that shut down at all, hmm. uh, to be honest. Some people are taking it seriously. Others are just going about their lives. Um, from my observation, there is no real sense of a lockdown. Um, very different from our scope out here in LA. Um, Yasser, I wanna say you look much more well kept than most of the people I've seen in quarantine. Are you fully <laughs> locked down out there in Florida? What's your situation like? Yeah, we're fully locked down. We're locked down here in Florida. Um, I just have a mentality of like, you know, just try to put your mind somewhere else. Uh, even if that means if you put on a nice shirt or something, you know, just do that. Uh, but yeah, we're fully locked down here. Um, I, it, it's funny cause I started right before the quarantine, probably like two or three weeks. I was starting this uh, photo project that I was working on, uh, which made me have to travel to some small parts of Florida. Um, and then once they started saying everyone needs to stay home first week, I really wasn't taking it that serious. I was like, I'm just going to drive out to the Everglades into these small towns and figure and just continue taking photographs. But then when they started announcing that, hey, by the way, the basketball games are going away, everything's going away, I was like, oh, this is, I have no choice. Like, we, we I guess we had to stay home. I live with my family. So um, it's like a bunch of us here. Uh, I love them. And then at times I want to murder them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> How many of you are in the house? Uh, my brother, my sister, my mother, and my cousin who's staying with us because she's studying nursing. Um, and that came in real clutch because she just, you know, just the first couple of days, she just went in and just got like all the vitamins, emergencies, Gatorades, everything. And then we have like this one section in our living room. Um, where everyone just goes every day and they take their multivitamin pill and just, um, you know, just trying to stay healthy. Um, you know, we have a treadmill, so I, I use that to try to stay, like, you know, fit. And 
just try to exercise and I'm still trying to eat as healthy as possible, even though it's really difficult. On May 1st, they're opening up parks here. So people are able to go to their parks um, and just hang out for the day, I guess. But I heard they opened up the beaches in, in Los Angeles. Is that true or not? Or like some parks? I think the beaches that are closed remain closed, like Santa Monica, but I believe Orange County beaches have, have not closed ever and they, they've remained open. I know oh, okay. Ventura beaches are also slowly becoming more open, which is leading LA people to plan to flock there. So I don't know how long they'll stay open for, honestly. It's yeah. kind of repetitive. I, I think this heat wave weekend, uh, there were a lot of people on the open beaches and I think Governor Newsom was kind of upset and was thinking about you know, how, to, how to address that. Yeah. yeah. Um, Dakota, uh, are, are you feeling oppressed or limited? Are you bored? Are you busy? Uh, have you found any freedom in this new, new reality? Well, you know, it's, it's funny. It's it, uh, being locked in in quarantine like this uh, definitely encourages the development of hobbies and habits. Uh, so, um, you know, besides working and, and studying the Japanese language, you know, I, I have cooked more actively than I have in, in years. And I'm, I'm finding a tremendous amount of joy in that. Uh, I've been learning how to um, cook different Chinese recipes that are, you know, my girlfriend's favorites back from China. And so that, that's been a lot of fun. I took up gardening as a method to, uh, to prevent boredom. And I'm, and I'm enjoying that as well. In terms of, you know, a feeling of oppression, you know, not, not necessarily um, especially just because of the way that the Japanese government has handled this whole situation. You know, if I want to go outside, I, I can go outside. I do have access to pretty much all of the normal daily life of living in Japan. I choose not to use it. Um, I do have to go to the market every once in a while. And I often take walks around 10 p.m. at night. I have a nice little park right next to my house that has a, a river running by it and I just walk the river at 10 p.m. and there's nobody else around and I put in a podcast or listen to some music. Um, but, uh, but you know, I'm just, I'm just trying to stay sane in those ways. Um, just trying to keep my days busy. You know, uh, before all of this happened, uh, Yasser and I had actually, uh, as well as Andrew Narvaez, who was our photo editor when we were all at the Corsair together, uh, were going to shoot a documentary here in the summer. And unfortunately, because of COVID, uh, the documentary kind of had to be postponed uh, just because traveling right now is, is just not safe. Um, and so instead, we kind, of, we kind of regrouped and we decided to start a new project together and we're calling it Experiment, Experientia Magazine, excuse me. And um, so we've been devoting a decent amount of time towards writing and preparing that magazine, which is gonna be releasing here in, uh, in a few days. So between that work, language study, and my little hobbies here and there, I'm staying sane. Um, you know, there's obviously some boredom that, that, that comes into being stuck inside, but overall, I would say things aren't so bad. And, uh, and I'm, I'm definitely finding, um, finding the time to get in touch with my writing, to get in touch with my cooking and the other things that I love. So in a sense, it's almost been a bit of a positive. That is a comment I've been hearing from people that are particularly more creative or open-minded. Um, Yasser, I'm curious because I know you are a creative type. Has this kind of propelled you more into it? Has it hindered you a little? Anything in between? Um, yeah, actually, it has propelled me into it. When we were transitioning from from uh, classes to online, it was, it was just a nightmare, especially for journalism. I just said, this summer, nothing to do with school. Um, Where are you studying? At Florida International University, FIU. Got it. Got it. Um, and I just vowed not to do anything. But then I realized, like, well, you know, maybe this is a great opportunity for me to start doing something I want to do. So I signed up for drawing classes um, for the summer. Oh, wow. And just, yeah. So I get to do something creative, you know, just get involved in something I want to learn. Um, so I'm trying to keep myself busy as much as possible. I mean, there's been like, I have friends that would just say coronavirus is the time to learn something. Um, and it is a good opportunity you know, pick up a language or do anything that you wanted to do at the moment. Um, but I could see what, how someone could easily just like fall out of that because it's just boredom, absolute boredom. It's a horrific thing that's killed a lot of people already and, and will probably yeah. 
kill many more. But right. interestingly, uh, yeah. this is episode number 11 of the pandemic podcast. And in the first 10, many of the people we've talked to have, have made comments like that, that, that it's been a time to rethink their career or to kind of dive into, you know, whatever they do, you know, deeper into songwriting or whatever it might be. So yeah, I think learning something new or, or reevaluating has been popular for a lot of people. Meditating a lot too. Just taking the time to really like reflect on what you, what you want to achieve and what you want to do. Maybe you're doing something and just realize like, what was I doing? Or <laughs> <laughs> time, time for a change. And I could see that happening a lot. I, I felt that within me as well uh, recently because the journalism program at FIU doesn't really have anything to do with photography. I'm actually the only photographer in the journalism program. Wow. Um, and I just realized like, what am I doing here? After months of reflecting and then the coronavirus really pushed me, I told them that I just want to switch the major to the minor and then move to photography and that's it. Like, With that in mind, obviously we don't really know when this is going to cease. So for both of you, I just kind of wanted to quickly ask, what are your thoughts on your future in both of your areas? Are you kind of future tripping and scared about what it holds? Are you able to stay in the moment with your projects? How are you feeling about that? I'm actually excited for the future. To kind of build off of what Yasser and you guys were just saying, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's an interesting moment because we're realizing that a lot of us don't have this sort of opportunity throughout our adult lives to kind of put everything on pause and analyze it, you know, from, from a bird's eye view, if you will, and kind of view the direction of our life and view whether or not we're content with it. And so in that sense, you know, I choose to, to, to kind of view it as an opportunity, even though it's, you know, all framed around this sort of horrible virus that's killing people and it's terrible. But, you know, in, in that sense, I really, you know, try to stay optimistic uh, in, terms of, in terms of our futures. Um, and use this opportunity to kind of plot out the next steps. So, so for me, I'm, I'm very excited about what the future holds. Working with Yasser and Andrew again has been such a blessing for me because, you know, we are, we're unified in purpose and it's given us this chance to really kind of come together and lay out a plan for a project that I think we all hold really dear. Um, and it's allowed us to tap back into the sort of magical feeling as a team that we had when we were at the Corsair in, in spring 2019 uh, and build on that, which is a, an absolute privilege. Um, and so, you know, hopefully this moment of being stuck inside and this moment of sort of uncertainty will actually give us an opportunity to build a plan and build a future for ourselves that kind of reflects what we want to be doing, you know, in our heart of hearts, if you will. Um, and so, so for that, I'm tremendously excited, um, you know, but on that note, I also, you know, wonder about when I'll see my family again. I wonder, you know, my, my yeah. grandmother is getting really old. I, you know, I don't, I don't want to state anything, but you know, it's, I, I don't know if I'll come home, you know, in the next year, I don't know if I'll come home in the next two years. Right. So, so if there is yeah. any uncertainty and worry, you know, it, it's more so about, my parents, my grandmother, their health, you know, being so far away from them is, is difficult. But, um, but we love each other and we stay in contact. So, so overall, I'd say I, I'm trying to stay really positive about the future. Yeah, sir? I think working on this magazine now with Andrew and Dakota has given us like a, a really sweet sort of escape, but then it made us realize like this is something that should happen and we're taking it very serious and but, and this uh, magazine drops in a few days? Yes. And where will we find it? On <laughs> experientiamagazine.com. Okay. Uh, it launches May 1st. Our Instagram is experientiamagazine. Our Twitter is experientiamag. Um, E-X-P-E-R-E-N-T-I-A? Yes. Yes. Great. Did I just say yes to something? I didn't really <laughs> <laughs> You're good. It was right. <laughs> All right. Uh, Dakota Casting uh -huh. PDA and Yasser Marta, thanks for visiting the Pandemic Podcast. Well, thank you guys. Thank you for having us. And it was nice seeing you guys again. Yeah, it was wonderful. Yeah. Be safe, be well, and continue to express your humanity. And check in every Wednesday and Friday for new episodes of the Pandemic Podcast. <laughs>